power, I would very much agree with you. Let's figure out power over myself. Mm -hmm. Understand how power works in the external world. Understand how power works in the economic world. So if you're a spiritual person, it's understanding here's how power works. When do you use the stick? When do you hold your own power? It's not always just hugs. still a long way from the true integration of those four scenario domains that you identify of spirit, nature, economics and society within South African society, particularly in the mining industry. And if I may mention, it's partly not been helped because of certain Australian mining entrepreneur who has sought to take advantage of our situation. The conflict resolution process that the judiciary provides is adversarially based. You have a winner and a loser. And in my career, I've been privileged to work closely with lawyers, and I don't want to take anything away from the extraordinary work that they've done in holding the mining industry more accountable. Uh, Richard Spur is now become somewhat famous. I've been privileged to work very closely with him. And at the same time, I argue this point with him as well. One can use the law to force people to submit, but it's a pretty blunt instrument if one needs to get people to really cooperate. Now, that's a lesson those of us who are parents learn when our children reach teenager level. We've got to inspire rather than use force and power over them. So it's often when the power over strategy is over and there's a winner and a loser, well, that's when social workers get called in to try and help the losers pick up the pieces to create insight and to move on. Any thoughts about what we can do? Yeah. Um, well, it's very clear looking at, uh, if you look at Johann Galtung's work, right? The more alternatives, the more likely there's a peaceful solution. So this is building in futures literacy, the ability to think in terms of scenarios for five-year-olds. So they grow up with the ability to think it's not either or, there's a whole range of possibilities. So people straight away go from zero, everything is okay, to five, the world is ending. What about two, things are getting better. So there's one, two, three, four, five possibilities. So this is developing the futures literacy, conflict resolution ability, with young children all the way through. So if you look at, at marriages, right? Fight everyone, everything's gone to hell. Instead of, okay, let's look through alternative futures. Scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. When my kids were young, I mean, they're tired of scenarios now. They've heard this too much. When they say, dad, well, what should we do next in our lives? They're older. So well, let's do a scenario workshop. They say, no, please, no more scenario workshops. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're both quite brilliant. And I'm looking back at, the thing I'm happy we did with them when they were small, I remember once they were fighting over a teddy bear or something. Mm -hmm. And it was like, Dad, do something. And quickly I ran a future scenario workshop, you know, <laughs> which is one funny. of the solutions. Is it get a new teddy bear? Is it share the teddy bear? Is it rip it in half? Is it what's the real problem there? So this is the type of conflict resolution methodology we want to build into futures thinking and, and every society. Once you have that, the likelihood is people uh, will do better. So what you said with the infrastructure company, they're bulldozers. So that's obviously not working. They're not doing conflict resolution. They're saying it's their way. Now, sometimes it's okay to have one solution. We understand that there's a threat. Someone's you know trying to attack you. You don't do a conflict resolution workshop. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm getting out of here. Call the police. But in many cases, you actually want to create community and go over and over. But that assumes authenticity, assumes a willingness to dialogue. Mm. That has to be there. If that's there, the rest is possible. If it's not there, then all the scenario work won't work. Then it's just a will to power. I'm so enjoying this conversation. 
a few more questions, if I may impose on you. In, at the end of your interview with Mena Funduren, which is on YouTube, which I'll give people the link, you ended by explaining why you see psychotherapy as a prerequisite for becoming a futurist. Well, I took that to mean that that's where the spiritual domain comes in. And in that sense, it's not just about therapy. It's about heightened self-awareness. It's about humility. It's about meditation. Now, but, you know, in Western postmodern society, they tend to be uncomfortable with those who try and collapse uh, the bifurcation between the public world of facts, where science and law want objective empirical evidence for truth claims, and the private world of values, where matters of personal subjective belief and faith are the criterion for truth. How do you personally, as a futurist, transcend that binary and that dichotomy in your own professional work? Everyone has a different narrative or story they have to use, right? So I know in our futures work, we say be epistemologically clean. So if I'm saying, here's the future I want, here's the scenarios, who, who am I in that process? Mm. So the traditional modernist world was, it's a lever, I'm lifting the planet, I'm outside the process. Mm. Mm. And that's good scientific methodology, and we appreciate that, we honor that, that's important. At the same time, we're both very clear, we're in this process. Good science, when it moves to policy communication, has to be, here's my story in this. Mm. So scientists, this person with a lab coat, and now, of course, scientists is hero these days. So this transitions is important. In my own case, this spirituality is idealism, this Gaian love, and then the opposite, of course, all of us have to live with our opposite selves. So in foresight work, we call it the disowned self, the disowned future. I remember one workshop I was running, everyone imagined this green, gender equitable, spiritual city. I said, that's fantastic. I want to live there. I'm going to feel safe there. I want to feel welcome there. I'll feel at home there. And then we asked scenario two. I said, what's being disowned? What do we push away? And people said, nothing. This is the best future. But let me ask again, what can't we see? And these two engineers in the back of the room said, none of you can see power. You all want a green, spiritual, open, inclusive society. Cities are run by access to capital and who gets the ability to build building buildings and who makes money. That's what cities are about. And then there was this tension in the room and tension in all of us. What parts of us are spiritual? What parts of us understand conflict and tension? Then we said, okay, what's scenario three? And they were clever. They said, aha, for us to make this work green, spiritual, has to link with capital. We don't want huge capital, but we have to make the economic case. And so that became a, a very powerful way. How do I integrate the preferred, which can be very idealistic, the disowned, which can be brutal, with this third space? So in terms of my life, it's been about that. Here's a vision I have about the planet, global governance, post-meat, Guyan polity, a very different type of world. And I can see, well, that pushes away many things. So I had hope with post-structuralism, pluralism would lead to a better world. What I didn't understand, pluralism would become a weapon for the will to power to actually create a worse world. <laughs> and if you'll permit me to take another one of my hobby horses out of the stable and give it a gallop. I've spent much of my life and career in the apartheid era and now latterly in the last 20 years trying to speak truth to power. I felt a bit like banging my head against a wall. So I've stepped back and thought, well, let's be more strategic. Let's not so simply talk about speaking truth to power. Let's understand the nature of power. So I now talk more about speaking truth about power to try and promote insight how power works as an intoxicant. That, and the evidence is there, that over time leads to what Lord David Owen is written about the hubris syndrome, where there's a change of personality, where leaders lose touch with reality and become reckless, highly narcissistic, and frankly, very dangerous and unfit to hold office. Except getting them out 
has proved difficult even within evolved Western democracies like the USA because of the partisanship and the perpetual mutual scapegoating that tends to occur. In your causal layered analysis, how do you reckon with the reality of power? Because I'd like to see what potential it offers as a means of being more skillful in helping organizations transform and deal with the elephant in the room, which is who holds power. I'm saying this in the context of also reading the work of a really inspirational person, a fellow social worker, Brené Brown, who, who does maintain quite strongly that the power over era has long passed, that the future belongs in the 21st century now going forward to those who seek to find their power with each other. Well, <laughs> as much as I really do still believe that is true, the harsh reality of the world we live in and some of my own battle scars of having spoken truth to power and even trying to speak truth about power, do you have any guidance for me on that front? I mean, I agree with you, but there's citizens... So this is where when you have so much pluralism, part of that is people go to dark spaces, right? Uh, going into positions where conspiracy theorists, these alternative views of reality, they become quite challenging. So in terms of power, I would very much agree with you. Let's figure out power over myself. Mm -hmm. Understand how power works in the external world. Understand how power works in the economic world. So if you're a spiritual person, it's understanding here's how power works. When do you use the stick? When do you hold your own power? It's not always just hugs. From a scientific world, is saying, well, okay, I'm a scientist. I need to be able to communicate. Here's what I know, my authority. At the same time, we've gone from experts know everything to anyone on the street knowing everything, and now we're trying to figure out this third space. The non-experts have a role, but experts also have a role. So this is kind of this liminal transitional phase we're in. And like you, I mean, we're searching what's next. How do we create these new governance structures of the self and governance structures in the external world? And I wish I had an easy answer for you there. I'm you know, struggling with it myself, trying to figure out how do I, do I attend to those who are in the conspiracy world? Or do I say, no, they're in their planet. Let me focus on the world I want. And more and more, my lesson has been, let me look at my anger, my frustration, focus my word, focus my actions. Here's the future I want. I'm going to co-create that and find people who want to move in that direction. The mm -hmm. low road gang can go the low road way. That's not my business. Mm -hmm. I will focus on the high road. But also then there's a protective mechanism, you know, in spiritual life, right? Mm -hmm. If there's someone coming who actually means harm, we have to protect ourselves with. And I think we're right. There's many leaders, you mentioned the two, they meant harm mm -hmm. to themselves and others. So this is where we don't have those global protective mechanisms against that. Democracy was supposed to, but it does to some extent, but clearly not em enough as we need. Although you could say it's success, Mr. Zuma left, and let's see what happens in the U.S. next. Mm. Uh, in my first interview in this series, I interviewed a psychologist, Garrett Barnwell, and we found ourselves reflecting on the experiences of Viktor Frankl, who, as you know, survived the Nazi concentration camps. He survived with a 1 in 30 chance. And he attributed that to having exercised choice. And he said between stimulus and response is always a space for choice. No matter how much people try and collapse and restrict your freedom, and in the process of choosing, they're both therefore finding meaning. Now, I'm saying that to really honor you too, because I do sense that you're someone who shows a similar sort of humility as you seek to invite people to find their own core metaphor and work out their own story and their own transformational narrative. Well, what opportunities do you see latent within this COVID-19 crisis for us to take home? I go back to the narrative. I say, okay, what's your metaphor of your life and your future? Operate from that story. And then part two is, what's my zone of control, my zone of influence? I 
don't try to in futures get people where you can change everything because I don't think that's true. So really, I ask people, find out what, what's your metaphor of your life now? If COVID-19 is impacting, what's your new metaphor? Does that story work for you? If it's helping you stay moved, if it doesn't work, rethink that story, then find evidence in the empirical world to support you in that, in your community. If the old story now has been shocked, stop it. That's a used future. Get rid of it. Start working on your new story. I was just reading this one piece by someone who he wrote a chapter in one of our books, and he always thought himself as healthy, and then he saw his diabetes results. And then he realized his metaphor was eating chicken. And now his new metaphor became fighting chicken. He's going to fight for his life. Mm. And that, you know, that makes sense for him. And so then he came, okay, what does that mean? Monitor his health, monitor his eating patterns, exercise. So within his framework, this made sense. So I'm always very hesitant to prescribe, here's what people should do. What I've learned is people to go within find what your story is if it's working great if it's not how do i transform that and you know we're seeing the external world is a great reflection of that if we go back to how you started this covid 19 is a disease that could be narrative one covid 19 could be also a message if you go to now a non-scientific view right mm -hmm. from a psycho spiritual view what is the message it's giving me it's giving all of us what do we need to change and maybe the message is nothing for some people. It's like, okay. <laughs> but, I mean, there's no prescription there. <laughs> Just to comment on your needed pause scenario. Coincidentally, a few months ago, before the COVID-19 crisis erupted, I discovered another kindred spirit who I'm now hoping to interview. Somebody from Nigeria, Bayom Akumalafe to spread around the globe and see what he has to say. But the, what really got my attention, he has this mantra which says, the times are urgent, we need to slow down. Uh, obviously rather counterintuitive, but it resonates marvelously with your needed pause scenario. And you're saying we don't need to slow down so that we can speed up. We need to slow down, find a new mantra, a mantra which is a more moving from simply a rationality to a, to a modality of, ex, of, of engagement. So what is the new mantra we need to find in the midst of this pandemic? The mantra process in our narrative foresight work, there's one a metaphorical process. Here's my story today, right? And then you think, well, you will find the better metaphor. But the act of the better metaphor is still coming from a rational self. It could be the high achiever self. I want a better metaphor to optimize profit. <laughs> so this is when we go to the mantra part. You take people to a very quiet space and you link the mantra with the metaphor and allow emergence. So this one monk, Dada Prana, invented that. He said, the mantra emerges from your deepest self, a deepest part of you. It's a sound, a sacred sound. I've had secular people say, okay, in that process, they just say breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. And then at that moment, the old mind, the old metaphor, and the word, the sacredness, meet, and something new emerges. That emergence doesn't come from, let's say, the ego, the push yourself. It comes from a different part of who we are. And that becomes our new direction that pulls us forward. In complexity, chaos language, that's a strange attractor that coheres where we need to go. And that can't be predicted, and is different for every person. So this for us becomes the unexpected future and it emerges from a different self. And when I've done that, it's always quite surprising. I never know quite what's going to emerge. And I look at, aha, ah, here's my inner self giving me a message how I can change. Well, gosh, I don't know about anybody who's going to see this interview, but I can certainly, from my point of view, say to you, in the Sahel, this has been extraordinarily helpful to me. And thank you so much. Uh, what comes to mind is, and I see in your writing, you also refer to Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. In writing my book, I was learning how to write a good book and I was introduced to that and said, any, any story needs to follow that same basic uh, patterning. And I've seen it also now simplified a little bit. It says, the first stage of the hero's journey of the place of the mundane and home 
is a place of order. And then there needs to be a move to, if we're going to grow and develop, into a crossing of a threshold into a disorder. And it's in that disorder stage where we get lost and we need mentors and we need people to help us along the way so that we can push forward, push into the future. And there's an inflection point that happens when the curve of disorder suddenly becomes a curve up again into a reorder. That often comes when people find themselves at the entrance of the dark cave. And as a social worker and as a counsellor and helping people, I can tell them that you can only help you to get to the entrance of the cave. You've got to go in that cave yourself. And I can't give you any recipe or guarantee, but my experience has taught me from seeing a lot of other people going through their own journeys, that when you emerge, and you will, if you have faith, hope, courage, etc., there will be an elixir, there will be something that you have to share. Your narrative would have come into clarity again, and you would be able to go back home. Even though it might be a familiar place, it'll be a different place because you're a different person. I like that. The elixir from the cave. It's beautiful. Mm, good. Jaws narrative. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Another thought which came to me, somebody said, a spiritual writer said, you need to find your own center of gravity. Otherwise, you're going to be sucked into somebody else's orbit. Thank you. I think that's beautiful. You're thinking through here's the future I want. Am I living that story? Am I living someone else's story? And that's part of creating your gravity. If I'm in my authentic space, you're in your authentic space, then we're hoping it's more likely to create a more authentic world. Yeah.